Hey guys, welcome back. This week, I wanted to build off my earlier video about the Pelican, specifically expanding it beyond just being an aircraft and atmosphere and talking about its space applications. Space has its own challenges. It's a very unique environment. Maneuvering, powering, thrust, all that isn't what people really think it is. And so I wanted to talk about that this week, about how realistic truly will the Pelican be in space. And what we're gonna do is explore the power plant, how the Pelican generates thrust, seeking to understand that through some real world counterparts that have been made today. When it comes to the Pelican in space, maneuvering is the greatest difficulty. According to the Halo Encyclopedia, the Pelican has four vectored thrust fusion ram rockets and hyperfans. And that's kind of a lot of sci-fi jargon made to sound cool, but there are some very real world technologies that pair up with that. And that's what we're gonna talk about. When we come, like when we say vectored thrust, what does that mean? All that means is that the engine nozzle can pivot off the axis of the vessel, the spacecraft, and the aircraft in this case, allowing it to be more maneuverable. Things like the F-22 are capable of doing that. Fusion ram rockets is kind of a combination of a few terms there. Fusion powered rockets are a thing, at least theoretically, because we're not able to do self-sustaining fusion reactions yet. And then ramjets are also a thing. Pairing the two up, you could have a real world design that's a hybrid of the two, a fusion powered rocket with the capability to transition to a ramjet in the right atmospheric conditions. And when it comes to ramjets, really it's just exactly what the name sounds like. You're using the physical compression of air down the inlet, literally ramming it down the inlet. So you have to move really quick for it to be functioning, but as air is compressed, it heats up. And so you're able to spray fuel, which will then ignite, generating the exhaust and thrust necessary. And that's you know, how we typically do it with jet fuel, but there's other technologies by using nuclear power to accomplish that. And last, when we talk hyperfans, really what I feel like they're getting out there is just hyper-efficient turbofans. Because turbofans is kind of like a conceptual, like an idea. It's a very mainstream form of engine that's very popular. And we'll talk about how that actually can be paired up with the Pelican in ways that make sense. So how do we do it in the real world? Well, what if I told you that nuclear ramjets, despite sounding very sci-fi, are not? What if I told you they're real, they've been built and tested, and would you believe me if I told you that happened over 60 years ago? It shouldn't surprise you too much because when it came to nuclear power in the United States at least, it was the wild west. They literally tried to power anything and everything. So back in the early, late 50s, early 60s, Project Pluto was being developed by the United States that sought to build a nuclear powered cruise missile to carry nuclear weapons as a form of deterrence as well as strike capability and because they could fly for days at a time being powered through nuclear energy. And the idea there was you'd have an exposed fission core, because we don't have fusion, just fission, breaking atoms apart, but that generates a ton of heat. And so once it's released in the air, because it is a, a nuclear ramjet, it does require movement already, air would come down the inlets, it would be heated up by the fission reaction, the energy being released, which would then generate thrust. And they demonstrated that with a scaled down version called Tori 2 Alpha in 1961. And then shortly within a year after that, Tori 2 Charlie, which was a full scale model that ran for five minutes at full power. Ultimately, Tori 3 ended up being canceled. That was the following one. And that's largely because intercontinental ballistic missiles were more efficient, cheaper to maintain, and more capable and quicker for reaching a target compared to a cruise missile but the technology was all there. And although we can't create self-sustaining nuclear fusion reactions, we have to rely on fission today, there are developments that are starting to work their way towards that. You have things like the antimatter nuclear pulse propulsion by Penn State, which is still in like a theoretical like frame, but people, you know, universities, NASA, are trying to advance that technology. Finding the theoretical capabilities that once we have the ability to produce antimatter with enough technology, we could then actually apply. But to give NASA credit as well as the DOD back in the 1960s, they were gonna brute force their way through it anyways. They were gonna use something called Project Orion, which was gonna use thermonuclear fusion nuclear explosions to propel a spacecraft. And it's, it sounds crazy, because it's it, when I say brute force, I really mean it. They're basically gonna take thermonuclear weapons, which use a fission precursor for a fusion reaction for the main body. They were gonna push these warheads out the back of a spacecraft, and then they're gonna explode. And they have a big plate because an explosion is a very high impulse, a very high instantaneous acceleration. And that plate would absorb that using springs and dampeners to translate that into a like, continuous acceleration because humans are not very good at sustaining crazy high G-forces, acceleration forces, you'll black out. But that was the idea. You were going to use nuclear explosions to repel a spacecraft. 
and it's feasible and it would actually be faster than anything we made today. The problem was is one, people don't like nuclear explosions in atmosphere because you still have to get it to space. And two, you had the salt treaties and the non-proliferation and the ban on atmospheric testing, all that stuff in the late sixties put a stop to that. So it's only been theoretical and like disgusted in models, but never demoed because we agreed to stop doing that due to the effects it has on the environment, as well as the desire to reduce nuclear weapons across the board. And lastly, when we talk about hyperfans, like I said, this is just turbofans, which in, in, my, in my opinion, and turbofans are a very mainstream form of propulsion. You see them on, on pretty much every single airliner today. They keep getting larger and their cores get smaller because that core is basically just a turbojet. Air comes in, you compress it, you spray fuel, it then ignites, expands, spinning, uh, power blades at the back, which spin the compressor. So it's self-sustaining. It's what military fighters use. The problem is turbojets are not very efficient. So what they did is took very high efficient, kind of like airfoil shaped fans, and they put that on the exterior to the core of the engine. So as the exhaust air is spinning the, the power blades at the back, it's now spinning the turbofan in the greater nacelle. But that's not actually part of the engine. The engine, really the core of it is that very small turbojet. And that's why when you go and like the next time you're getting on an airline and you look down the engine, if you have the ability, you'll see clear air behind it. And that's because the turbofans are actually outside of the core. They're just kept within a nacelle because it keeps, you know, if the blade comes loose. Okay, so how do you combine the two? Well, when it comes to Halo, yes, the terms are mainly for sci-fi appeal and kind of jargony, but the technology is certainly feasible. For instance, hear me out, the Pelican could use fusion-powered rockets in orbit. You take the byproducts of fusion reaction to generate significant amounts of thrust. You have no atmospheric drag, minus a little bit from the solar wind, so there's nothing really there to slow you down. But because you have no atmosphere, you have to use the byproducts because you have nothing else to release. Radiation material stresses wouldn't be as much of a concern because you're 500 years in the future, there's technologies they can use that would be better. As you start to aero break through the top of the atmosphere, you're already at hypersonic and supersonic speeds. People sleep on the fact that you're gonna be moving incredibly fast in order to deorbit a spacecraft. So as the Pelican's coming down, all it needs to do once it's in that like, you know, Mach 3 uh, air regime is pitch down, open some inlets and allow air to go around the exposed kind of fusion core where it would be heated and then expanded out the back as thrust. So instead of releasing fusion byproducts, now you're using the atmosphere in a nuclear ramjet mode, which is completely doable. As you slow down, then you can transition to more of a, a bypass turbofan. And really what I would say there is maybe you already have a, you know, maybe not necessarily a compressor, but you have an exhaust portion, a fan, and the blades are gonna be relatively like flat, like no angle of attack. They're not turning with the, the air when it's in ramjet mode. But once you slow down enough, variable geometry for compressor and power blades is doable. We have that today. And then you can turn it so the compressor and the exhaust start to turn. And then that will turn the big high bypass turbofan that you could open the inlets further to expose the atmosphere. And if you look at the Pelican, it does have very large inlets. So there's nothing that precludes having a big turbofan behind those, and that would give you your low speed performance. And then you hit every rung on the ladder. You have your orbital maneuvering capability, at least when it comes to the main form of thrust. We don't know about RCS like reaction like control thrusters. Once you're in atmosphere, you can use ramjets for incredibly high rates of speed and high atmosphere. And then when you wanna hover, you can transition to a turbofan, which is actually still very efficient. So overall, the Pelican relies on, again, some sci-fi terms and kind of like self-justifying, and that's okay. You know, sure, they're trying to justify being a dropship capable of taking off unassisted to orbit and returning, but the technology, that's doable today. And given enough advancements, it could be scaled down and made simpler to actually fit on something like a Pelican. That's really the only hangup is we don't have the means to develop it at a small enough scale for it to be useful. But in the future, that will be doable. In the meantime, I hope everyone enjoyed this. If you like content like this, feel free to like and subscribe. I really enjoy seeing your guys' comments, particularly there's a lot of you out there that have a lot more experience about certain topics than I do, and I really love learning the things that you all know, so feel free to leave me feedback. I hope everyone has a fantastic week. Take care.